All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, this is Pete Browning here at uh, Central Region Headquarters. Uh, we have uh, a group of folks here with, uh, at headquarters, Mike Hudson, Jim Keeney, and Kim Runk uh, is with me here. We are also uh, recording this session this morning, so if folks uh, want to watch this later, uh, we'll have the recording posted shortly after we uh, wrap up here this morning. What we want to do this morning, uh, there's been a lot of uh, uh, requests for uh, briefing on the verification and validation uh, that was done for IBW during the 2012 season. Um, we presented this information at the AMS meeting uh, in January, and so we're, uh, we're uh, in a position today to present it to the central region offices. Uh, I will start off and I'll talk about verification uh, numbers that we, that we calculated, and then uh, Ken Galupi from the Wexham Group uh, will uh, we'll then talk to the validation work that was done. <clears throat> so, I mean, just a quick uh, you know review of the, some of the the goals of our IBW project, and they continue to be the goals this year. <clears throat> we uh, you know we created an experimental product. Uh, all, it's the demonstration of the warning alter, alteration, an experimental alteration of the warning product. Uh, and basically, the goals were to provide more information for media and emergency managers, uh, and with the with the goals of facilitating an improved public response and decision making. <clears throat> Our intended outcomes was to optimize the, the warning system within the existing structure. You know, we're basically uh, do no harm to the warning process by you know, we certainly don't want to certainly unable to change the uh, the warning product. Uh, dramatically or beyond what uh, you know what everyone is set up for so uh, we had to work within that structure uh, motivate the proper response uh, by distinguish better distinguishing uh, situational urgency and realign the warning message in terms of societal impacts I think everyone knows you know all of this stuff we briefed it multiple times here <clears throat> so you know in the evaluation and uh, you know I, we looked at what what was done during the year, and we you know we had a pretty meager uh, severe weather season last year in the five offices of the IBW. The IBW was carried out in the eastern Kansas offices of Topeka and Wichita, and the three Missouri offices, St. Louis, Springfield, and Pleasant Hill. Um, I'll show some uh, sh uh, verification data. Um, basically, I'm using the um, information uh, that. Uh, Greg Mann, and, and he had some help up there with, uh, with folks uh, at the Detroit office, um, basically going to use the, a lot of the work that he did in, in validating, of, of producing a verification uh, of the warnings that we issued. Um, and it's going to um, basically focus on quantifying skill at predicting more impactful tornadoes. The uh, IV and, uh, and V, uh, led by Wexham, uh, Ken will Ken will address that after I, after I go through the verification part. <clears throat> so, you know, we had basically a drought, and uh, we had very, you know, we didn't have a lot of severe weather. Severe weather was, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, in the demo area, about 40% of the average annual events that we normally see in the last five years. Uh, majority of the events, occurred in eastern Kansas, and a lot of it occurred on a single day with a the, with the big tornado outbreak in mid-April. Uh, so uh, the performance metrics that, we'll, that I'll show here are really skewed toward, you know, the Wichita office, uh, and they experienced about 70 percent of the IBW um, defined tornado events in the demonstration area. I'm going to step through here. This, is, this isn't all of the severe weather that occurred in the demo area, but it's much it, it captures the uh, the more significant days, and this was the April 14th day as I was showing here on the graphic. And if I step forward, we had the more severe weather on the 27th, and and uh, in May there was a few episodes. <clears throat> um, but you know it's it's pretty again a pretty sparse severe weather season, uh, which is you know which is good for people. I guess they didn't you know there wasn't a lot of damage and and fatality. There weren't any fatalities. 
but uh, not good for a demonstration project. We, you, you usually like to have at least a normal season when you're trying to uh, uh, do something new and, and, and validate and verify what's going on. So the, the verification data is, is pretty, uh, um, pretty weak because you know, there's just not a lot of data to work with here. But we'll, we'll show you what we got. So in looking at it, like an overview of verification, um, I mean, basically the risk is a function of the, of the hazard character and vulnerability, and, and we're going to focus in on the magnitude and intensity portion of, of, of the characterization of the hazard. <clears throat> when, when we look at this verification, um, you know, we're, we're basically going to you look at a categorical uh, verification mode. So that way we can look at the skill measures, you know, that are unavailable at, in a binary mode, uh, you'll see that the uh, <clears throat> the, sc the scores that we're going to show it's uh, slightly different than what what you're used to, but very similar. Uh, and I'll get into that here in a minute. Um, but first, a little background. Each each warning or tornado warning is followed up with severe weather statements. Uh, we evaluated all of those. Um, we evaluated against the observed conditions, adjustments to the uh, damage threat indicator, which is you know really what I'm going to show here is the tornado uh, verification of, to of tornado warnings that we consider we, we call base warnings. Where these are the warnings without the damage threat indicator in included, and then verification of those warnings that had uh, damage threat indicator of significant or catastrophic. Of course, this year we've changed the word significant to considerable. <clears throat> and each, each follow-up statement, if the statement changed the, the category of the damage threat indicator, uh, either adding it in or, or changing its value from uh, significant to catastrophic, for example, then we treated that as a new warning uh, in, in the tally of warnings issued. <clears throat> Evaluated uh, in two categories here, warnings without a tag, and then grouping the significant and catastrophic uh, tags together. <clears throat> we used a uh, service-based uh, perspective. So uh, what, we, what we're trying to find out is, uh, you know, when you issue a warning um, at a polygon, what happened in the polygon? And so uh, we're only verifying each one of these uh, polygons with one tornado, and we use the highest EF scale the surveyed uh, you know, within that uh, warning. So if there are multiple tornadoes that occurred during the lifetime of, of a warning, uh, we're looking at just the highest EF scale value um, that was assigned to the tornadoes during that time period. And all unwarned tornadoes are, are considered missed events. <clears throat> so starting to look at the data, and, and we had, you know, basically, again, like I said, it's, it's, it's really there's such a small sample of data to look at that it's you know, I don't really know what you can make, uh, you know, from these numbers. They're really not significantly uh, uh, a significant, uh, statistically significant because of the small number of events. But, you know, we're, we're, it's what we have, and so, you know, people are interested, and we'll show you how things went. <clears throat> we had a total of 10 IBW-defined significant tornadoes, which were rated EF2 or higher. Uh, during the, the, the demonstration project. Um, and this you know, generally compares to an average of 17 per year since 2008. Again, we had a, you know, didn't have a lot going on. Uh, IBW tornado warnings exceeded tornado warnings. Again, because we used the, uh, you know, when the SBS changed the category, we treated it as a new warning as far as verification went. Uh, and so, um, you know, when you compare the, the uh, on the left here, the tornado warnings, uh, this is based on, on the number of tornado warnings issued. When you add in uh, the SBSs that made a change, then there was uh, five more of those. So, uh, so for IBW tornado warnings, we had 78. For verifying events, uh, traditional verifying events, there were 81, but IBW defined tornado events was 59. Once again, we only counted one tornado per, uh, per warning with the highest DF scale. So of those 59, the breakdown was uh, 33 EF0s, 
uh, EF1 and 16, uh, EF2 and 3 were uh, 9, and there was one EF4, um, falling in the EF4, EF5 category. <clears throat> so we constructed this uh, contingency table so that we can look at, uh, you know, PID, FAR, and CSI type of, of measures. Um, and just to go through this quickly here, we, we have the breakdown of the, like, say, EF0, EF1, um, EF2 and 3, and, and 4 and 5. You know, we broke these. Uh, we're really looking at EF2 plus, but, we'll, you know, if you, so if you, for example, when you look at the SIG cat uh, down here, significant or catastrophic, uh, you know, they'll, there are hits in both of these categories. But we broke them in part here so that we could look at, say, near misses here. So if we had uh, a base, we say we had an EF, you know, we can we can include uh, the EF2, EF3 category um, into the into the base. You know, how, what would those score be? Or if we had issued a significant, for or, uh, for example, and uh, and we had an EF1, you know, what would what would that be? So we we could broaden the categories here for an, for what would be considered sort of a near miss uh, type of uh, categorization and look at those scores as well. So I think we're all familiar with with uh, contingency tables like this. <clears throat> so we calculated uh, similar types of scores. You know, again, we're familiar with POD, FAR, and CSI. So in this case here, we're looking at um, you know probability of category detection, uh, probability of uh, a percentage of false category categorization, which would be similar to our FAR, and then a, a, a categorical CSI uh, measure. <clears throat> but, you know, once again, uh, these numbers, so, you know, you crank out statistics and you get percentages, but you got to please remember that the sample size is extremely small here, and, um, you know, I don't know if these numbers will will bear out as we, you know, as we expand the IBW this year across the region, uh, we should have a lot more cases uh, to work with, especially if we have a normal season. Um, and um, and then I think this year's, you know, the 2013 verification, uh, if we use the same measures here, will give us a much more realistic uh, view of, you know, of whether the forecasters, you know, how, how skillful they were and, and using the, the damage threat uh, tag compared to uh, significance of the tornadoes. <clears throat> so let's look at uh, look at the graph here. I'll basically plot it on the graph. Um, you know the, these different values. That, uh, so you have event based, which is this traditional uh, verification in blue. So that's the first column on each one of these uh, CS, uh, POD, FAR, and CSI. Um, <clears throat> and then um, if we consider the IBW based um, warnings and and uh, tornadoes. And verify that, uh, and then we look at the uh, uh, base tier category, the significant tier category, and then and then we have the near miss of base plus one and the sig plus, minus one. So this is again the sig is 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 significant and cat, uh, catastrophic combined in that. <clears throat> so some details on on here that worth pointing out, but. Um, <clears throat> So you know these these uh, IBW statistics are, are very similar to the uh, those that we traditionally use. Uh, um, so you know it's, it, it kind of shows the representativeness of the IBW methodology. If we look at FAR uh, or hit rate, 59% uh, of the IBW tornado warnings associated with IBW tornado event, uh, you know, there's 59% of them ver were verified. And we can infer. A moderate degree of skill here. Um, if you know, if we were thinking yes, no, the uh, probability of uh, categorical detection (PCD) for significant tornadoes uh, that's the EF2 plus um, slightly higher than for the what was, you know, not not using the tag, the weak tornadoes, 70% uh, versus 63. Um, <clears throat> the hit rate. Um, you know, which is one over the false alarm, is uh, <clears throat> percentage of IBW warnings, EF01 categorical tier uh, is nearly identical uh, to the EF2 plus tier. And it, again, it implies that we have, you know, an equivalent skill in identifying the weaker versus the stronger impactful uh, 
tornado. Forty-seven <clears> percent <throat> of all the warnings containing a tornado a damage threat indicator were associated with an EF2 or greater tornado event. Seven out of the fifteen. Uh, <clears throat> the remaining eight, you know, had tornadoes. Um, four were followed by an EF1. One had an EF0, and well, three had no tornado. So uh, only five of the eight had uh, had tornadoes as well. So if we looked at, now if we looked at the near miss categories, uh, you know, <clears throat> focused on that, uh, basically 73% of all EF1 plus tornadoes were associated with a warning containing a damage threat indicator tag of significant or catastrophic. Um, <clears throat> and the hit rate for the EF0 to 3, which is the uh, um, base tier plus one uh, was 54 percent. The hit rate for EF1 plus warnings, uh, the significant tier minus one, was 73 percent, 11 out of the 15 warnings. <clears throat> so, you know, the false categorization, you know, I mean, is notably decreased for the broadened broaden significant tier, which implies the ability to identify storms that have greater potential to produce more substantial tornadoes on that. <clears throat> So this is, you know, this is encouraging. Uh, the the small sample really, again, I you know, I don't want to. This is not any any anything that we want to uh, draw any 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 significant conclusions from. But I, I think we can say that there's some implied skill here. Again, the data is small. It's limited to just uh, a couple offices, and 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 just really most of it's dominated on the one day. So, um, uh, so you know, I think we need, we really can't make much of this data. I think I'm encouraged by seeing seeing the numbers that we have here, uh, but we really need to broaden it, and um, you know, and, and get a lot more information about about uh, you know whether we have the skill or not to uh, um, in identifying these more significant tornadoes that produce the higher damage on here. So you know, we'll. We'll continue to uh, watch this data this year. You know, I, uh, we'll have the 38 offices, uh, you know, playing playing a role in in, uh, in issuing the warnings. Uh, most of the warnings, of course, will be will not have that tag. Uh, you know, I think these the tag usage is a very rare um, situation. Uh, we just happened, I don't know whether we were lucky or not lucky, but last year we just happened to have this one major outbreak uh, that allowed um, the issuance, you know, and, and verification of, of the use of these uh, damage threat indicator, uh, uh, damage threat, tornado damage threat tags on that. So I really, you know, really going into this last year, I, I almost expected that we wouldn't even have any warnings with this with this type of tag in it because you know these very high end tornadoes aren't that uh, common. But uh, so with a larger area, I suspect we'll have uh, more data that we can add to the sample here and uh, and and see you know if we can get a little more significant with the values on that. So, so at this point, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Ken. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Appreciate the opportunity here. I do want to recognize the rest of my team that was uh, helping as uh, Jessica Lasego at University of North Carolina and Burl Montz at East Carolina. And then there was a couple of students that we had. Uh, first, we're, we're part of a weather for emergency management team that we've been working with weather service for several years now and really trying to understand emergency management and looking at your products and services and how we can better you know, improve those over time. Uh, we use use cases uh, to actually uh, delve into these things, winter, tropical, and then last year was central region with IBW. You can switch. So our approach is, is comes at it from the emergency management side of the house. Uh, Jessica and I are both uh, meteorologists, so we have a have a, that perspective as well, and Burl Moss is geographer uh, from the social science perspective. So from Wexham, uh, besides emergency management, we have a framework that we try to connect your community to theirs, and that is through the risk paradigm that the National Research Council came up with 30 years ago. And we also put together a four-step iterative method to kind of drill into this as opposed to trying to do a big requirements analysis. And I'll briefly describe that but not get into detail. 
Next. Again, try clicking yourself and see if that works. Ah, there we go. Oh, now how do I go back? I want to. There we go. Okay. So the first uh, is to understand emergency management. And I'll take time to explain this because we find in, in working with a lot of your offices uh, that you think of emergency manager as being that county emergency manager or a city emergency manager. But we want to stress that it's really a community of communities. And there are actually 15 sub-communities that are operating. And only one of them is the emergency manager. And the reason that's important is those who are making decisions in, to actually do something uh, for safety could be any or all of these 15 and not just the emergency manager. Assuming the emergency manager gets all the understanding and communicates what you're trying to say to all those 15 is a, uh, an assumption you don't want to make. So we, we try to stress that you're communicating to a bunch of different folks these things are trickled out there via through text messages, but they get out there through a series of, of emails, lots of different ways that they're communicated within these communities. And just be aware of that. But some of your targets of emergency managers is actually going to be a 911 dispatch person and not the emergency manager. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're out there. And the other point I wanted to make at this is you, to be effective at what you're going to attempt this year is to do an outreach to these folks. So if you're aware that these they exist, the outreach and setting preconditions on anything you change is so critical for effectiveness. Just changing and putting out there that I have changed this product and this is what it has. Make no assumption that they will understand what you're trying to say until they actually have to use it. So setting up the preconditions in an outreach fashion is so critical here, and I'll touch upon that later. It's not letting me go again. I'm trying to advance the slide here. That's good. Um, so the framework that, that we use, and this is not something we came up again, Research Council did, of how government interfaces to those being uh, that work with government, is the risk paradigm. Uh, you, uh, as weather servers, operate on primarily on the left-hand side. It is a left-to-right-hand connection of deal with hazards, and you're very good at, at uh, describing those hazards and trying to get the in-out impacts that it's going to blow off roofs, trees, flip cars, whatever, as an impact. The right-hand side is what you're trying to get to change is the action decisions of emergency management. And weather is one of many inputs that they have to consider. There are political consideration, resource constraints, and onward from there over on the right-hand side. And the real question is, how do we connect them together? Next slide. So again, uh, you operate on the left and working towards trying to, to the best of your ability, say this is what the hazard is and what it will do to you. Click. They are on the right-hand side developing what their policies and procedures are, evaluating all the consequences if they do something or if they don't do something. And that eventually leads to the actions and decisions. What is starting to link is the risk communication that they are getting uh, from you uh, that they're interpreting, and that's going to lead them to certain actions. Next slide. What we find through evaluating these things when we march across left to right that there is huge gaps in between uh, that deals with which houses specifically, which town, which part of town, when specifically, you know, 10 minutes from now, an hour from now, two hours, et cetera. Uh, so the vulnerability, they're trying to help, they're trying to figure out and where, where you leave off and where they have to interpret is where we see gaps and things not being done the way we would like. So it's this notion of risk characterization and risk communication is what causes the issue. Next slide. The so four-step process, I'm not going to go into it, just mention uh, that you will see this process come up. And the first is the baseline. That is to make sure you understand how they operate as a baseline, who is doing what. Make no assumption that you think you know what that is, because we find more and more there in the Midwest, and I was a forecaster out of St. Louis for way back in, years ago, that was the emergency manager and really is uh, mostly dependent upon 911 dispatch. Uh, for getting the warnings out to folks, because the EMs are out driving around trucks primarily. The second is to look at current practices, who's involved with that, how they get the knowledge, where's it coming from, what do they use, what don't they use, how they gather information, lots of different things are involved there. 
Uh, prototyping, and this is what you did, was a prototype last year. Prototype and get instant feedback from them. Is it getting them the knowledge they need? Uh, not asking them, do you like this better? Because they always tell you they like you and they like what you're doing, et cetera. But really, are they using it? And then to validate and, and make recommendations where we're getting it. Next slide. So in this demo, uh, we, we were uh, invited in to, to help do an independent evaluation of the effectiveness of IBW, not to say it was right or wrong or whatever, but is it effective, yes or no? Uh, so we started in February. Um, we used our, our methodologies, focusing on EMs, and, and we were going to look at media. There wasn't enough cases, really, to do the media. Uh, to say, is the message getting across? Um, and as Pete said, you know, limited seasons that we could limit what we were able to really pull out of here. Next slide. But the iterations we went through is, uh, again, piece by piece, you build one upon the other. We started with uh, back in the uh, March time frame with focus groups to really kind of set this baseline, what's going on out there. Uh, number two was to do this uh, check of how well the outreach was really done. We, we talked to a number of different folks out there and found that uh, our estimate anywhere across the region was 30 to 50 percent effective, which leaves an awful lot of the population not really prepared for what you were doing. Uh, we did some surveys, lots of interviews, and then, then April 14th the event took place, and we did post interviews asking different kinds of questions than what's normal, uh, finding out what actually transpired, did they even know about the message, did it make any change in actions, et cetera. Um, I followed up with some more interviews by the end of the month, and then May 19th, I don't remember where that event was on May 19th, but there was a minor event, and we did the same thing uh, through May. Uh, we then survey. Surveys, when you're pretty sure what you're looking for, you want to confirm those sort of things. Uh, doing a fishing trip on, on a survey is not necessarily a good idea. Uh, but surveys um, led to then the 13th and uh, number 13 and 14 is focus groups really saying this is what uh, predicated on what we are knowing, what do people really think and what, how would they change it if they could create the gold standard. There were 10 groups, total five forecasters of 5 EM, and we're going to show those results uh, as well as others here in a second. <clears throat> we did um, another conference, more surveys towards the end of the process. Next slide. There are lots of results, and I apologize that you don't have the report today, but you will have early next week. I'll get it to Mike for distribution that will have results like this. We uh, surveyed as part of the non-IBW in the upper Midwest, and there was a couple hundred responses, uh, as I remember, of whether this was a good idea to give more insightful information dealing with the urgency in this case, and the agreement was, and perceived wise, that was a good idea. Next slide. Uh, this one was we're trying to assess the severity and was, whether is that a good idea. And you will see that the perception on the EM community is getting this kind of information, uh, they agree. Uh, very few are thinking that there, there may be something that may not be a good idea. Next slide. Uh, so when, and then uh, when you get at um, will you get complacent, which is always a question and concern that everybody has. There is a, a perception, right or wrong, that it could lead to complacency, and we need to understand that. Next slide. Focus group results, uh, back, primarily back in, in August, and Pete was with me, and uh, I don't remember who else. These are what 10 focus groups independently came up with as the six things that they are looking for when it comes to warnings. The threat and its magnitude, which you're hitting upon, Timing, location, duration are critical. And there's still, uh, even with what you have done for this, still groping at timing, location, and duration, uh, which gets them to the vulnerability and then characterizing risk properly. History of the storm coming at them is critical. And then number six, although this is not a priority order, number six, confidence is critical in the path. I'll explain a little bit of that later. Next. So how we go about evaluating this thing, the primary ones are these six critical elements. We line them up on a matrix, and then we want to march across the risk characterization, how we're going to communicate that risk, and then how are they going to manage that risk. Next slide. 
there is a scoring here. Again, it's effectiveness. Um, so we're not saying it's, we didn't find anything, any reason that there would be a negative detriment in everything it has, so we just scored it from zero to five being very effective, or extremely effective. Next slide. So in terms of the, uh, just the characterization part along these six, you will see along the top row um, that the scoring went up uh, a little bit with four, three, uh, in terms of is it effective in helping to convey the threat? Twos in terms of timing, location, durations. You know, it's not terrible. You got something, but you also had it in the old message of saying that, that you are getting some of that information out there. Confidence of the forecaster, uh, we were able to see very clearly the confidence of the forecaster went way up on the hazard description. But uh, go, click the slide. I think there's a circle on here. <clears throat> One of concern is vulnerability, and people's interpretation and understanding of vulnerability was low no matter what because uh, they're still guessing as to which specific populations and when. Next slide. We go to the far right of the risk paradigm in terms of management, uh, deals with risk perception, uh, the decision making and safety actions. Now, we have very little information on safety actions, so we just rate those as zero is not really observed. Next slide. Okay. Risk communication is then uh, where things were kind of getting a little squirrely there. You got to look at the message packaging. How are you going to put this into a package? How it's going to actually get delivered? And is it being delivered in such a way that it's going to be received? <clears throat> what are operational considerations that, that need to be thought through? And then this thing that we call confidence, um, com competence and comfort, the three C's that always seem to derail things. Uh, these are those squishy things that we can't really articulate. But I'll state from a decision science point of view that only 25% of decisions is made upon the rational, tangible facts. Uh, where, when, you know, at timing, it's the 75% of beliefs and values and emotions and things that come into play. And we have to understand when they prop up and how they interfere with what you're trying to do. Click again, please. So the threat and the magnitude, we definitely saw that there was an increase of, of uh, effectiveness of just trying to be able to communicate something more than what you were doing before about the threat uh, itself. Next, next one, please. We also saw an increase of confidence because you were doing things differently. Therefore, their confidence went up on the receiving side. And therefore, we saw actions being taken or delivery of message in a different way. Just the fact that you did something different. Now, whether it was because of the tiering or what have you, uh, we don't have enough data to really do that, but we do know that you do something different, they react differently. Next slide. So the findings and recommendations, uh, I won't go through these in, in detail, just highlight a couple of them, but on the hazard side, really you need to get to all six elements as a package uh, to, to get to effectiveness. Just improving parts of it is okay, uh, but not having all six elements being addressed. So using things like pathcasts, regardless of if you make it fuzzy, they're okay with fuzziness. It doesn't have to be an exact time and exact, exact location, but giving them some indication of what's going on in, time, uh, in terms of time, location, and duration gets them out of the guessing game, uh, and therefore it will go up. Um, forecasts, as we heard over and over, was giving them something more to express what they were really were thinking. Uh, on the impact side, yeah, so-so. I'm, I'm not convinced there that it was making a huge difference, um, but they thought it would be useful for people in the public side. Uh, the C under impact I will emphasize is that we hear over and over, they want your best guess, otherwise they have to guess. Even if you're, if it had a lot of uncertainty to it, uh, when you caveat it, whatever you need to do, having your best guess is better than their best guess, and then that's how they react. Next. Vulnerability is the one that we have a lot of deficiency in because it's being, again, a lot of it interpretation as opposed to dealing with facts. Um, uh, but B is probably the critical one. Whose job is it really? Well, that's where you need to collaborate, in my opinion, between the two organizations to collaborate to get to whose job is it really to figure out exactly where and when. You just put the, just the science out there, there's no guarantee that there will be a change in any kind of action for safety. Um, okay, that's just circling and highlighting that sort of things. 
Okay. Um, the message packaging, where we find a lot of deficiencies. Is there a circle on this one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, significant is is overwhelmingly was being overused uh, in in a lot of products, and there there's so you talk about overwarning, um, overuse of significant has now made that that word a kind of almost a useless word in many contexts. So we found some hesitancy in using uh, elevating to catastrophic, understandably. Um, and so, you know, in your training and in your discussions as to exactly what you're going to do to go from one level to significant to catastrophic uh, should be addressed a little bit. Again, you can read these things as when we, you have all the slides um, and we can go through them later. Next slide. And message delivery, um, we understand that you're starting to use social media and other, other things uh, out there. Uh, I'll make a general statement here that when you do something out of the ordinary, that has a far greater impact on emergency management decision making than anything else. Whether you are indicating that you're going to get on a phone call with STC uh, or you're on NWS chat using different language than what you normally do, these sort of very informal things seem to really move up in terms of delivery and the content of that message than all the formal things of changing messages and, and products, et cetera. So the EMs are starting to use the social medias more, uh, more and more, heavily depend upon NWS chat, uh, and they're queuing off your words uh, and the frequency of communicating on chat and, and what you're saying and what you're putting out there. Uh, they're queuing on those words probably far, far more than what you think they are, exactly what the word is that you're using. And listening to, you know, reading in between what your, your, uh, your voice is saying. Operation considerations. Many of the EMs are doing other things, uh, particularly the, the EM proper. Uh, so they're not even reading these things. So they're getting it from somebody else. And that, in, in many cases, maybe a 911 dispatch is literally reading the message over the radio. Uh, again, operational considerations in your outreach, you need to understand how these messages trickle through your communities. And we're finding it um, almost county by county differences certainly state-by-state state differences. So we highly encourage you before this kicks off April 2nd or whatever the date is, is to do an effective outreach. If you have questions of what you might try, uh, we'll be more than happy to help you there. Um, the other big finding that we're having here is uh, they get the SPC messages, and it's almost, instead of uh, ready, set, go, it's ready, go. And that really bothers them. Um, having something in between that's setting, the getting their thinking in line with your thinking as conditions are changing is highly, highly desirable. Now, how to do that, I don't know. Uh, but they, they're sitting there waiting, twiddling their thumbs, trying to infer off NWS chat or something else, and then all of a sudden everything starts kicking off. Um, and, and that's not a desirable situation. Next. Um, competence comfort, again, uh, comes up over and over and over. This is the complacency question. It is the competence question. It is how much training these folks have. Uh, I can tell you that training, training, training is not the answer. It has very diminishing results after a period of time. So you can train to remind people here in the spring uh, by uh, May or June, if nothing has happened, that that training has kind of fallen by the wayside. Experience, number of years in the job helps more so than training. So just be cautious of, of just you blitz them, you know, over a two-hour meeting uh, is, is not going to be terribly effective. Risk perception is critical. Uh, we're still trying to understand what does it mean to perceive risk when all these other things are distracting. The perception of risk is, is decreased, and therefore uh, decision-making is impacted. Next slide. Um, again, we only had the, the couple cases last year, but we did find in, in one case, and I think it was on the slide, I may have missed it, uh, for the Wichita, because of the word catastrophic was used, we saw an EM did move fire trucks out of the way in the event that it would have been catastrophic, and he would have lost his resources. Did move them, 
uh, didn't happen, but that's uh, secondary. He made the right decision to uh, plan for it properly because he saw or heard that word. Um, next one. Okay, so in summary, uh, the, the six critical elements have to be taken as a package. You've addressed two of them, uh, one directly in terms of the severity uh, of the threat, the other uh, incidentally in dealing with confidence. Uh, the other four elements uh, were not directly addressed in IBW. Just be aware that any of those six missing uh, is going to decrease the likelihood of action being taken need to figure out some way to, to really, when you're talking to these folks, uh, whether it be through chat or phone call or what have you, working towards that vulnerability assessment uh, is critical. And giving them some sense of, of vulnerability really says be specific which location, which time, um, and how long to expect it to be outbreaking, this kind of thing. Gets to vulnerability, that characterizes the risk. Um, <clears throat> just having the impact is insufficient. The informal cues that I mentioned, um, beginning to think more and more that it actually has more of a dominant effect than, than uh, the science itself, uh, but that's just personal opinion. Um, IBW, we saw overall, is having potential. We see increases uh, improvement for effectiveness, and that's why we recommend to, to further explore it. Um, the bottom graphic there is what was interesting, and Pete may want to comment, when we did the focus groups in August, all 10 groups independently, five forecasts or five EM, <clears throat> independently either verbally described or actually drew on a board something that looks like this. And what it says is it gives them some sort of which ways is going a kind of a preconditioned alert further out. Uh, in the two parts of that, it gave them some sense of what you were thinking uh, of, of what was what what areas you're concerned about, how far out in advance you're looking at mm -hmm. these things. And it got them in tune with what you were trying to do, uh, and it covered all six elements. Uh, so I don't have an answer. Of this is how you do it. If we got into prototyping, we you know could flesh that out. Um, some of you guys actually drew something like this, but um, finding it that when ten groups independently, so times five, fifty people independently come up with the ideas. It, gives us some creeds of you might want to think about. I think that's the last slide, isn't that? Yes. So I rushed through that. You'll have these slides and you'll have the report that has all the detailed findings next week and be glad to help in answering questions. Hopefully I saved enough time for you, Pete. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Um, I think we do have a few minutes here, so uh, I can open the floor up for uh, any questions from, from the offices. Hey, this is Glenn I don't have a question, but I have a, a comment and uh, kind of one statistic that was left out in terms of the April 14th event is that um, here at McConnell Air Force Base, because of the proactive uh, work that was done down here to of the threat, and then on the day of, they moved the whole KC-135 fleet, uh, so millions of dollars. Uh, DOD could have lost, uh, and I think similar things were done up at Whiteman Air Force Base with the B-2. Uh, perhaps Andy or Julie can speak to that, but uh, more than just uh, you know local fire trucks being moved, I mean there were millions, if not billions, of dollars uh, saved by um, of the IBW and the proactive work that was done prior to the event uh, by the Air Force. But that is great to know. We ought to capture that anecdotally, uh, um, Pete. Yeah, and I think I think a lot of um, a lot of the awareness that occurred on April 14th on that outbreak was um, was days in advance of about a coming severe weather event, and uh, it was really I mean like five days out. Folks started talking about it in eastern Kansas. Uh, SPC put a high risk out on day two, which is the first time they've ever done that. So there was a lot of awareness well before IBW and the warning process started on that. So I think I think a lot of a lot of that preparation was done based on those outlooks. I believe that that's probably very true. But we do see that even in the short term, the more that they understand, they emergency managers understand your dynamic thinking as conditions are unfolding. 
uh, that that gives them a lot more information to go off of than waiting for a message and, and, and words in it. So somehow to communicate that, they would love to actually watch you on TV as you're thinking and doing these things, but obviously we have practical limits. I heard Glenn, I think. Yeah, yeah, thanks, uh, Pete. Uh, and I appreciate Ken's comments and the work that, that his group is doing. Ken, Ken in the, your uh, comments, you mentioned there's a perception, right or wrong, uh, that this, and I think you're specifically talking about the IBW uh, prototype process, that it could lead to complacency. And that was one of the questions that, in fact, we had one of our media come out here and for an interview uh, yesterday or the day before, and that was one of the questions they asked is, you know, is there a concern that that public response is going to decrease for untagged warnings? And I guess that's, um, you know, what what was your experiences e either from the offices or from your reviews that that came out of this uh, last year's experiment? Okay, uh, we got lots of survey data to, to back up this this statement I'm about to tell you. From the EM perspective, complacency will not go down. Uh, from the public perspective, which we did not assess, I repeat, our focus was not on the public. We're not sure. The perception is it could. But from the EM perspective, we have overwhelming evidence that they do not believe uh, that this will lead to complacency. This is actually providing them much better feel for what they should be doing and not leading to false alarms. Uh, we have other, other evidence in surveys that say that false alarm is, is a false impression within emergency management. They don't believe that there is a false alarm. It's just the quality of the alarm. <clears throat> so any alarm is better than not having something. Uh, even if it's riddled with uncertainty, having your best guess is what they're after. So, again, we got the surveys before and after that, that pretty well indicate, and we've seen this in other use cases as well, that complacency and false alarm, at least in emergency management, is probably not true. Yeah, I just I just want to add to that, as Pete. Um, you know, I think, as as Ken said, I don't think we know what the public, how the public's going to treat this. But I, the use of the sort of the elevated uh, impact statements with the tags. Damage, uh, um, tornado damage threat tags is again going to be very, very rare, uh, you know. And you know, I think we all know that the the killer tornadoes are these higher end tornadoes uh, on that. So, you know, if if every day they're getting tornado warnings, it's business as usual. But they get this um, one day they get a warning that's got this enhanced wording and and uh, you know urgency uh, to it. You know, I think we our hope, and we don't know, but our hope is, you know, the folks get off the couch and go to the basement or whatever shelter they need to go to uh, on that. So, um, I think uh, I think if we use the tags a lot, overuse the tags, uh, then perhaps we risk that that part of you know going that way toward the complacency issue. But that's my thoughts. I, I think we need to. We need still need to tease this out and see how, how this yeah. is going. Need, need more evidence to really know. But yeah. that the, what we did uh, hear very convincingly was use of the term significant. And I think you're you're changing that word, correct, Pete? Yeah, we uh, changed it to considerable. Hey, Pete. Yeah. Yeah, this is Sioux Falls. Uh, this is a question for Ken. Ken, well, I, I, one part of your slides was uh, about that the EMs don't read the warnings or don't hear the warnings. Would it, did it ever come up or in the questioning process of maybe having this tag in a separate product instead of contained in the text product of the warning itself just to have something that we could quickly send out to uh, the customer base? Um, recommendations along those lines did come up of using other, uh, other products or rearranging and having uh, your current warning rearranged to highlight the critical pieces and then put all the discussion part further down. Uh, so when it, uh, if, if they're not reading it, or if they can get that blip over a text message or the 911 person is reading that piece, uh, they're reading the whole message right now and it kind of gets buried in there. So yes, and that, uh, if we had uh, time to go through prototyping other ideas on this, uh, like we could have flushed that out and maybe you want to try to think about those things.
Okay, I think we we'll probably have time for maybe one more question. If anyone has another comment or question. Hi, this is a uh, Goodland. Uh, I had a question about the uh, the statistics you had on the uh, significant tornadoes. Uh, how many of those did not occur on April 14th? Um, because I, you know, April 14th, like you were mentioning, SBC had the outlooks days in advance and that help raise awareness and you know it's pretty obvious the big days you know when you're going to have significant tornadoes but I was just wondering about uh, you know the lesser days that you know you can have in F3 or F4 um, you know were there any days like that? Yeah unfortunately not really I mean the data is really dominated by that one day um, and so um, you know it, it's I, I agree with you I think I think that was a remarkable uh, event in the, in the fact that there was so much awareness of the upcoming event on that. And, and you know, I think, again, the, the data is really skewed toward that day, and it was, you know, it was well handled as well. Uh, so, so, yeah, we'll, we'll have to – I think this year we'll get a better view of the statistics uh, by having more officers involved and hopefully a more normal severe weather season. Hey, Pete. Yeah. <clears throat> I could offer a little bit of information here, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Um, on May 19th, we had a, that was the other one of the other events that they had studied up there. We did have a, an event that day that uh, began as a so-called landspout day, where um, but some of these grew up scale, and so they actually became quite strong. And we had two of them produce EF3 damage um, that day. <coughs> one one hit a wind farm. And the other one leveled a, a, a homestead, and uh, I can tell you that uh, we did not go any kind of higher level tag with that. I know we discussed it here, but uh, and we did see a debris signature on the dual pole data, and by that time um, we had determined it was already on its way down after that. So I think at least from our standpoint, the things that we're looking at doing the tags with the higher level tags is in situations where our confidence is high, and uh, and that way our probability of detecting that is, is also high, and instead of uh, you know these other events that that are more hybrid or, or less confident. So, I guess that's all I really wanted to add there. But I hope that helps. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ken. I you know, and I think I think these tags will be useful for those uh, you know long track, uh, uh, long lived supercells on those types of uh, types of days. So, all right, I, I think it's, uh, we've gone an hour here, and I, it's a good time to wrap up here. As, uh, as Ken mentioned, uh, the, he's going to provide us the, the written report next week, and uh, we'll get that out to everyone for, for their, if they're interested in looking at more details on that. Recording uh, we'll make available, uh, well, this call we'll make available shortly after, uh, by this afternoon, and uh, other folks who couldn't make the call could, could view this and and if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to uh, send them in to uh, myself or Mike Hudson, and uh, we'll be glad to answer. Thank you.